let's see, can Washington, D.C. become a state? D.C. statehood is an idea whose time has come. Statehood for Washington, D.C. is one of those hardy perennials, Christian, but it never fully blooms. If you oppose D.C. statehood, you support taxation without representation. You hear me? There are around 700,000 Americans who, by law, have to do what the rest of the country tells them. And it just so happens they're all neighbors living in Washington, D.C. Eight and a half out of 10 of them want the district to become the country's 51st state. But there's a lot of powerful people who don't want that to happen. Let me explain. The nation's capital has its own unique, passive-aggressive way of reminding everyone who visits that, in a special sense, living in D.C. kind of sucks. It's right there on the license plate. Taxation without representation. Reminding everyone who walks or drives down a D.C. street what the deal is if you live here. That's called taxation without representation, and it's not fair. <laughs> That's a population bigger than either Wyoming or Vermont, who effectively don't get a vote in Congress, because they live in a place that was specially designated as a federal district over 200 years ago. They don't have senators, and their one representative in the House can submit bills, but can't vote on them. And not only that, but members of Congress from other states can all team up and override the stuff that the local D.C. city government actually wants to do. Take marijuana. Way back in 1998, D.C. passed a ballot initiative to legalize medicinal marijuana with a 69% popular approval. But Congress refused to fund the initiative for over a decade. And because of a single Republican from Georgia, which is very much not D.C., Congress even kept the results of the ballot from being made public for nearly a year. When the people of D.C. voted to decriminalize cannabis possession in 2014, a Republican from Maryland, which again is very much not D.C., led an effort that banned the city from spending any money on regulating the cannabis market. The upshot is a bizarre local weed gifting economy in which you pay someone like 50 bucks for a pair of socks and they give you a fat bag of sour diesel as a gift. And let's face it, nobody needs that many socks. I will sell you my regular t-shirt for $15, or I'll sell you my t-shirt with love for like $100, and that includes my free gift to you of cannabis. There are scary consequences to Congress having the final say on city issues. In the late 90s, DC wanted to set up a needle exchange, but Congress nixed funding for that idea too for nearly a decade. The district ended up with the highest HIV rate in the country, nine times the national average. When D.C. finally did manage to get the needle program going, HIV transmission rates fell by 70%. The ability to make life or death decisions impacting the public health of its own residents is far from the whole story. You may recall back in 2020, there were some protests. Black Lives Matter! Because D.C. is federal territory, guess who got to deploy federal troops all over the goddamn place? Are you with the Bureau of Prisons? Your military? You're not commenting? And this is part of the reason why stuff got kind of intense. A few months later, when a bunch of out-of-towners stormed the Capitol, the mayor of D.C. didn't have the power to send in the National Guard. Because, you guessed it, that's the kind of power you get when you're a governor of a state. We know that the Defense Department initially denied DC's request to have more National Guard troops not only surround the Capitol, but secure the Capitol complex. The irony here is that DC was set up as a non-state in the first place to try to stop this very kind of thing from happening. The idea, in part, was to block any state's governor from having the power to control the nation's capital and potentially take Congress by force. But now, Democrats are talking seriously about switching up the district's status again, for all these reasons, and making D.C. number 51. In reality, that would mean shrinking the capital, and Washington, D.C. would become Washington, D.C., with the D.C. standing for Douglas Commonwealth, named after Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist who Trump seemed to think was still alive in 2017, 122 years after he was not. Frederick Doug Douglass is an example of Somebody who's done an amazing job and is being recognized more and more, I notice. Proponents say there's a clear racial justice angle to this debate. 
For much of its recent history, DC has been a majority black city, where some of the biggest decisions were being made by white men in Congress. This April, for only the second time in history, the House passed a bill to give DC statehood. And the result showed how the idea's popularity has grown among Democrats. Back in 1993, 40% of Democrats voted against it. This year, they supported the bill unanimously. It's still gotta get through the Senate, which it won't. While Democrats are all for it, Republicans are unanimously against it. Because if it actually happened, DC would get two new senators. Two very, very, very reliably Democratic senators. DC may be home to a lot of things, including some of the best American music most Americans have never heard of, called Go Go. But it ain't home to many Republicans. And we know that by looking at the results of the presidential election, which is one part of national politics DC people actually do get to join into with three electoral college votes. Biden got 92% of DC's vote, and that was not an outlier. Republicans see DC statehood as a naked power grab in the Senate, and they're coming up with all sorts of wild-eyed arguments about why the people of DC shouldn't get to run their own lives. Because DC's right to vote in presidential elections was established by a constitutional amendment, some conservatives say that making DC a state can't be done because it would need another constitutional amendment. But in late May, 39 constitutional law experts wrote a letter to House leaders saying that's not the case, and that Congress has the power to make DC a state just like it did the other 37 times. Other arguments are less boring, or seemingly thought through. Like, DC can't become a state because it doesn't have all the things that apparently make a state a state. DC would be the only state, the only state without an airport, without a car dealership, without a capital city, without a landfill. Not only is that a ridiculous argument, it's not even true. If there's a car dealership in DC, I apologize for being wrong. I have no idea where it is. Then there's the argument that DC residents have some sort of inside track with federal lawmakers because they live near where they work. There's no question that DC residents already impact the national debate. For the members here today, how many of you saw DC statehood yard signs or bumper stickers or banners on your way to this hearing today? Because we all know those senators in the Capitol, when choosing between their constituents or a sign they just drove past, well, their constituents don't stand a chance. I mean, look at how successful the license plate campaign has been. And while I get that adding a couple senators is a big deal, the Senate is already slanted towards small rural states because they all get two no matter whether they're Wyoming or California, which means that Republicans frequently win majority control of the Senate despite representing a minority of the country. As in, like that's eight out of 14 elections since 1994. Some have raised the idea of a compromise in which DC becomes a county of Maryland through a process known as retrocession, basically where Maryland takes back the land that it gave up for the capital back in 1790. There's just one big problem. People in Maryland don't actually want that. More of them would rather DC become a state. The bottom line is, as long as it takes 60 votes to get anything done in the Senate, thanks to the filibuster, DC isn't likely to become the 51st star in the flag anytime soon. Because Republicans would be loath to give Democrats any advantage. And if that means keeping 700,000 Americans disenfranchised, that's just the cost to win the game. <laughs>